Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back. Psychedelic here. Recording this Sunday morning, transitioning into the afternoon. Hopefully upload it today still. Took a trip down to Omaha yesterday, just kind of an impulse drive. Just kind of felt like digging. I haven't really done that in a while down there. So picked up on three LPs there, which I will share. And then I got one, well, actually two from Lincoln, but I haven't talked about, well, I've talked about one, but I'm going to reevaluate it. And then one online pickup. So a lot of goodies in this batch. So let's get started. Man, these were the best. I mean, I listened to these last night, uh, the first two here, and it's been a while since I've listened to both of them. And like I always say, the vinyl experience is always the best way to go every time. Uh, even though streaming is nice and it's easy, it's convenient. There's something different about the vinyl experience where you get all the, you know, different frequencies hitting at you at two different angles and just kind of soak up into it somehow better than, you know, on earbuds or, you know, through a Bluetooth speaker, which is usually the case for me. But last night, man, I got transported. <laughs> I did with these two, man. Um, and I know what they sound like. I hadn't listened to them in a while, but these really hit the spot and I was really glad to spot these. Uh, I went to Grapefruit Records, which is kind of my go-to shop. They always supply, you know, certain styles that I'm always into. And these were in the used section, actually. I think I may have spotted this one brand new, the next one coming up. They might have had in stock for a while, but someone must have returned it or something, but had never seen this one in person, not even the reissue. Decided to pick up on these trails. I was really happy to see this. You know, it was a little pricey. You know, they are kind of getting a little more sought after. I mean, this reissue is over 10 years old, but I've been really wanting to scoop this up for a while now. And originals, I'm kind of forgetting about those. You know, they're pretty scarce. This is kind of my secondary choice. So it's through Drag City. This came out in 2011. And I kind of knew the backstory, not entirely. I knew it was kind of like a couple that were involved in this. I think they were a couple. There's a couple different sources that say otherwise. Maybe they're just acquaintances or friends on this island because they were based from Hawaii, th these trails. But there's also a third member who is primarily like synthesizer. Yeah, ARP synthesizer, which is like, you know, kind of that mini keyboard. Uh, he also played recorder and certain arrangements on here, and it says here the final mix. But it was basically the whole mindset of one woman on, in particular on here, Margaret Morgan, who was, you know, kind of what you could call, like, instead of nature boy, nature girl. She was very much, like, enthralled with the whole island, the scenery, just the way of living on uh, Hawaiian islands. I forget where exactly they're based in Hawaii, if it was Honolulu or Hanali, perhaps. But anyways, those two, Margaret and Patrick, are the kind of the duo on here. And they just sweep you away into their own, you know, experienced worlds living off the island. And all in sort of this like very psychedelic folk, majestic sort of sound. To them, I, I don't even think maybe Psychedelic was even quite latching onto their style. I mean, they had some experience, you know, living in California, or at least the woman did, ha having gone to school there. And she came back a few years later, recorded this with Patrick, and sort of just took on a whole new lifestyle. Learned all these different instruments with the dulcimer, acoustic guitar, and kind of set the boundaries with these acoustic settings. And then... You know, having Dave Choi on synthesizer, sort of given all the treatments, the textures that it needed, and really scoped this one out well. This was a fantastic listen last night. Um, starts off, you know, with a few short tracks, you know, two-minute tracks at best. But after that, 
it gets even deeper. I mean, it gets even better than that. Psych one and share your water. When I first dove back into that, I was like, whoa, this is, this is just a continuous, you know, ethereal kind of spatial, but also exotic way that they're, you know, using these progressive moments. And then the track, Hello Lou, by the time this side had concluded, I was like, I'm so glad I picked this up. I'm going to be spinning this one for a while, I think. All the way up until the last track. This thing just sweeps you away into their exotic world. And in such a natural, organic way. just love this one. Uh, it does come with a lyric inner sleeve here. I think, I think it's missing lyrics to the track Hey Lou. But it's got the rest of the lyrics on here. Or Hello Lou, I should say. So yeah, it came out in 73. It's also got credits on the back for a surfer with his feet on the sleeve here. Boogie Kalama. <laughs> Must have been just another native friend of theirs. But yeah, I really enjoyed this one last night. I'm going to give this a lot more spins. I think it has an inner, yeah, inner sheet here. Kind of talking about the backstory. A picture of Margaret. I don't think she's no longer with us. At least that's the source that I came upon. I think it was in the Acid Archives. It listed that maybe somewhere. Yeah, very happy to pick this up. I think it was released, yeah, like I said, in the US only, but in Hawaii. I'm guessing maybe 500 copies. They just sold to people locally. Never really went anywhere after this. Just kind of did maybe, a, I don't even know if they did any shows. I don't think they did. But yeah, if you're into that kind of style, man, you know, Bobby Brown, the enlightening beam of Exonda, and whatever few Hawaiian records there are out there, this is really worth seeking into. This has the hype sticker here. It never shows up correctly, does it? <laughs> Anyways, so this next one too, um, I listened to this one kind of on and off throughout the evening kind of putting things away in the house and you know as I was listening to this so it had been a while but I've known this one since probably I think on Rate Your Music it said 2015 is when I first rated this and this is one that I was kind of excited to see I also found their debut record but this was kind of more desired by most critics and fans and just wanted to pick this one up first this is Mice and Rats in the Loft by Jean Dukes de Grey I think that's how you pronounce it, or Jan Dukes de Grey. This is their sophomore LP and oftentimes more acclaimed record. Their first one, Sorcerers, which I think was on the DECA label through Nova. They, Like I said, uh, Grapefruit did have the reissue there, but um, I just wanted to spend it on this one. I did get this one practically for free with trade and just a few bucks off of the uh, these trails, so that was good. Brought some trade in. And this was a great listen last night as well. It just really took me places. I, I need to do a little deeper listen to this one, but you could tell there's a lot of depth in this as well. There's a lot of lots of different styles moving throughout. It's primarily progressive folk, sort of in the way of like Comus first utterance or you know, fresh maggots, maybe. Maybe not as intense as that. Or maybe this is more intense, I should say. Um than less mellow folk. I mean, there's a lot more intensity. It just keeps driving along. There's only three tracks on this one. And very complex arrangements, but once you listen to it a few times, I think you'll kind of latch on and see all of the different movements that they make their way through. It's just really um, kind of unique for its time. I think this came out like 70 or 71, I think. It's on the Trading Places reissue. I think I have a few reissues on that label. Um, yeah, only three members. And you could definitely tell they were influenced by, of course, the psychedelic era, post-psych era, with stuff like Pink Floyd coming out in the UK around this time. And I think they were associated with Pink Floyd at one time. I was reading, um, I had totally forgotten about, um, I think they were trying to make a record like in the mid-70s and then didn't, didn't release till like 2010. Yeah, this is, this is kind of a masterpiece in a lot of ways. It's got a lot of great passages, different segments they move through. 
and you know some delay effects, use of flute, clarinet, and saxophone, and some trombone, trumpet, but not not in a very not in the way you would think they would, like with brass rock or anything, but it's got some more folk rock elements, especially on the last track. They get a little more wild and zany and almost in a Canterbury style. It's really intense. So, yeah, I love that cover art, too. It's just, it's such a English cover, right? It's just, it's just totally the type of humor they would throw at a sleeve or a project like this. It's really cool. This also has a hype sticker here. That one comes in a little better, I think. So, yeah, I got, the, got that one for a good price and plays well. Sounded really nice last night. Like I said, those two really transported me. And then the third and final one, I got this at another shop in Omaha at Record Benders. Hadn't been there in a while. It's usually the same stuff when I uh, look through the alphabetical section, but I don't think I had known about this record at the time since my last visit. This had been on my want list probably for about a year or so, and they're always cheap. I don't know why I ever pop, didn't pop on one, but I just kind of wanted to seek this one out myself when the time was right, and it was right with this price I found it for. This is Charlie Brown. Not that Charlie Brown, but this is Up From Georgia on Polydor. It's basically a Mel Gibson lookalike. <laughs> Maybe. Um, yeah, he had been associated with a few groups, I think, like around the New York State been in a few groups but I think this is his one of two records he made back in the day and this is actually you know looking at the cover and everything else you'd think maybe it's kind of like a ritzy country rock thing and it kind of is it's more like swamp rock which is totally not my bag but I'll leave a sample at the beginning of this video so you can get a taste of what you'll get into here it's actually pretty ripping guitar record got a lot of great ripping guitar passages. Um, I think my favorite so far is Row Row Rosie. It's originally a song by Van Morrison, which is someone I can't really stand. But he does an awesome, it's got a really tight rhythm, great groove to it, and some ripping guitar licks on there. I really enjoyed this. Um, I streamed this in the car on my way back, and I think the first half works better than the second. The steam kind of rolls off after a bit, but this is so fun to listen to. It's kind of more of a fun listen than anything else, not to take too seriously, but for five bucks on average, I think you can find this. And it's got some good, it's got some good strength to it. It's good original writing on here. Um, not much more to say, except uh, check out the first half I got, Row Row Rosie, and I think the last track on here ain't gonna stay is uh, another big highlight so yeah kind of kind of interesting record swamp rock not necessarily psychedelic in any way but acid rock fused definitely maybe unintentionally and I don't really know any performers on here I couldn't really find any info on who played on this record except uh, mr. mr. Brown but yeah so it's, it's a good one and then yeah, these next two are from Lincoln, um, from my go-to shop, Vintage Vinyl. And this is one I just was kind of snooping around the A's through Z section and came upon this. Didn't know he had it in the shop for a while. Maybe it had been there for some time. But the last time I listened to this record, I was not, not really vibing with it. But now that I brought it home, like I said, the vinyl experience works out every time. Keith James, One Tree or Another. This is on the Rare Earth label. This came out in like 72. Again, another singer-songwriter type. Maybe made, I think, just this record. And maybe was associated with a few groups around the time. Not a whole lot known about them. But they, there are some, also some very good tracks on here. Uh, it's kind of Baroque pop. Kind of swoopy. Kind of sweeping around. But... Also with kind of a harder rock edge in some spots as well. The track that really stood out to me is Life is a Night, second track. But again, it's one of those cases, you know, major label, 
lone singer-songwriter LP. Doesn't get distributed, you know, doesn't get promoted or anything. And kind of just sank without a trace. Few people probably talk about it these days. And I don't think there's been a vinyl reissue of this at all. You know, it just only came out back in the day. And it just kind of sits alongside with the remainder of all those kind of lost solo records of its ilk. It's not very distinctful. His voice is just not working or gelling too well, I don't think. But musically, the backbone of this works out for the most part. It's maybe above average, but nothing to like shell out, you know, 20 bucks on. <laughs> But it was a fun listen. I do have to listen to this again. Some of the tracks aren't very memorable, but I got to uh, give this another dedicated listen before I judge any further. And then I talked about this one a few videos back when I did my whole $2 raid. Kenny Rankin, Mind Dusters. This one settled a lot better for me this time around. It's a very short, very brief LP, but it's very breezy folk pop. You would think, looking at the cover, maybe it's like a protest record, sort of like a, a Phil Oaks type of bag or something. But it's it's not really. It's pretty mellow, pretty gentle. It has a great version of Tambourine Man. Um, moments of like sitar, a couple light fuzz breaks here and there, but it's mostly Baroque pop, great string arrangements. I'd say my favorite track is It Never Changes, which features his wife on vocals as well. I think she's part of this project, Yvonne Rankin. So, and he was also on Johnny Carson, apparently, back in the day. And Johnny Carson wrote the liner notes for this record. It's kind of interesting. This is a promo copy. Uh, like I said, really enjoyed it this time around. And you can find this also for five bucks, roughly. So it's really also worth investigating. Probably enjoyed that one a little more than Keith James. And as Seeking a Thread would say... In any case, <laughs> no, I'm only saying that just because uh, this next record here is kind of what inspired me to pick this one up. He had showed this one maybe in a couple last updates when he was showing some ambient stuff. And I finally just bit the bullet and said, let's do it. Picked up on Macaba, Maracaba by Klaus Weiss, Klaus Weiss, a German fella. And this is an ambient record. The Ritual Part 1 and 2 is nearly an hour long. And this one, I've been listening to this one quite a bit, streaming it at night and sometimes at work. And I was like, this is one I'm going to pick up on when the moment's right. And um, like I said, Seeking a Thread, Dom, he kind of inspired me to finally uh, reach for this one. And really glad I did. This sounds great on the speakers. Uh, it's a brand new reissue. It came out last year, 23. And it's primarily Klaus, but it's got another guest on board, Ted Dejong, on percussion. And as it says on the back, he does Tibetan singing bowls, zither, harmonium, drums, tambura, and no synthesizer. Which, you know, listening to this, you would think, got to be some electronic noises going on, right? Apparently not. That's the secret sauce. <laughs> but I really enjoyed this. It's got like four different segments i want to say even though it's like you know two pieces it's got maybe four or five different passages it moves through and i'll show the label here nothing nothing crazy about the label but kind of a plain label no no liner notes and klaus weiss he was associated with popol Vu during like their third LP era, I think. I think he worked briefly on those, playing the tambura. And yeah, he's got some association there with the kraut rock scene. And he's released several self-released cassettes back in the 80s and 90s. Um, and this is one of his like early, earliest releases back in the day. And really, really glides along. It's very soft, uh, droney at times. Then there's also some moments where it kind of sounds like dulcimer, but I don't think it is. It's got kind of this ringing zither, well, it's a zither, sort of trickling along and really majestically kind of haunting. Like I said, mostly 
mostly a drone piece. Klaus takes you into those kind of worlds. And it's very calming, very healing music. And yeah, the transfer sounds really nice. And this has got a little hype on here as well. So yeah, I really enjoyed this. It came out in 1982 on cassette. All the tape saturation kind of milking into the mix a little bit and just absorbed it all. So Klaus Weiss is really one of those artists I'm really listening to a lot more recently as far as like ambient sounds. I got a whole playlist on my phone where I've been playing those kind of things. So uh, I think that about wraps her for today. So hope you guys enjoyed. Check out these trails. <laughs> Man, that's the highlight of this video. Really glad to um, finally pick up on the reissue. I think they're kind of going for about 40 bucks or so now, which I about paid for this one, uh, minus that trade I got. Makes you feel like you're sitting along the seaside with your other half and just kind of soaking in the moment together. Um, and it's got a very spatial sound, you know, it's very vast in its sound, uh, very cosmic in its own way. Nothing quite like it. So, with that said, thank you once again for joining me and hope you guys enjoyed my live stream last Friday. Didn't have quite the numbers we had the last two streams, but, you know, people are busy watching football or something. <laughs> Anyways, take care and we shall see you soon.